Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host today and every every day or this week and every week rather. And I'm a filmmaker and a writer that has been working with CCF for 10 years, actually over 10 years, uh, 11 going on 12, in fact, creating all kinds of video content, live video series and Q&A sessions like the one you're going to watch today, um, patient-centric documentaries, treatment-based videos, conference and event videos, hundreds of videos in that span of time, but all with the one single mission in mind, and that is to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do. So uh, the value of this show, if you're new to the show, uh, first of all, I want to say welcome. And the value of, of Lunch with the Experts really is twofold as I see it. One, the information and advice you're going to get from our guest presenter today. And two, the shared experiences, the shared uh, stories, the support, the camaraderie that exists within the community, in the overall net community and the community that we've cultivated here on the show. So I urge you to embrace them, to lean on that, to leverage that support. Do so by introducing yourself. You see people in this in the comment section now saying hello, where they're where they're signing on from across the world. We love to see that. Um, who knows? You may see someone in your same state or your same region that you can connect with. So introduce yourself, reach out to people. Don't be afraid to ask questions uh, or share your own experiences because that is definitely part of the value. Now, before we get started, we always want to thank our sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals, because without their support, we wouldn't be able to do the show. But we always have this disclaimer from them, and that is the, that the opinions expressed by the, the guest presenters today, as well as the questions asked by you all, the audience at, at home, haven't been created or suggested ahead of time by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in today's presentation. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests today and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, that last line is really the takeaway. We're going to give you some good general advice, uh, good answers to your questions, hopefully, but uh, by no means do we or our guests know your specific case, most likely. So uh, take that general advice, take those answers to your question back to your home team, which does know your specific case, and make the best plan and path forward for you. That's that's what we ask. Now, I'm very excited to welcome back to the show for, I believe, a third time, uh, Dr. Satya, who goes by Nanu Das. How are you, Dr. Das? I'm doing well, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me back. Is, th is that accurate? Is it your third time? I think so, yeah. Then, my friend, you belong to the famous Third Timers Club. I talked about, uh, you know, Saturday Night Live has a tradition where the Fifth Timers Club, they get a jacket. So I think we might have to implement something like that here at Luncheon with the Experts. But for those who might have missed your previous episodes or don't know the work that you do, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you work, and the role that you, that you fill in this net community we've talked about. Yeah, so absolutely. So I'm a gastrointestinal and phase one oncologist at Vanderbilt in, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm really interested in drug development for neuroendocrine tumor patients. And so where I work and I focus my career in is um, in PRRT and some of the sequencing of PRRT and also clinical trials with new drugs for patients with both neuroendocrine tumors and, and high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas as well. So that's a little bit about it. Absolutely. They uh well, we know they uh have quite the program there at, at Vandy and they uh they seem to be adding to it too. So we love to see that. A lot of uh, a lot of the fr uh, friends of the show, friends of the foundation uh are there with you. So um folks, go ahead and start sending in your questions today. I've got a few announcements before we get going. Um, uh, but for those that are new to the show, and just as a reminder for those that uh that are regulars, uh the best thing to do in terms of asking your questions. Uh, we may not get to them all. We're going to try to. So if we don't, first of all, I want to say, or if you have follow-up questions, you can always reach out to Carson and Cancer Foundation here on the Facebook page. You can private message them. You can visit their website right behind me at carsonoid.org. But I want to try to get to as many of your questions as we can. So if you can ask them in, in ways where they're generically phrased, again, we don't know your specific case. It's really hard to make specific case uh, um, or give case specific answers in this format, right? Especially if Dr. Das isn't your your doctor, so try to answer, ask them rather in generic ways so that we can help get get you that information that you can take back to your home team. Um, and it does help me if they're uh, in small smaller chunks, just because we get a lot of comments. And at some point, 
once they reach past a, a paragraph, there's like a read more button. And so I have to open that and it just, it, it causes delays. So little chunks and then continue to ask your questions as we go along. Feel free if I haven't gotten to yours to ask again. If you have follow-up questions, I encourage you to continue asking. Like we're going to try our best to get to them all. Um, but another thing that I will ask, uh, well, first of all, I want to ask if you know something that should be here and they might have forgotten the show, go ahead and tag them in the comments or share this video to them. We want to get them here. They can always watch the replay if they're not here, but the, the value is really this interactive one-on-one -on -one session. Um, but also, if you see a question in the side box um, that you're interested in or you're, you're, you're seeking the answer to as well, you can just under that comment or that question, you can like it, love it any of the emotions that Facebook allows you to use. And what that does for me is it effect, effect, effectively upvotes it. So I see if eight people have the same question, that's one I'm going to make sure to get across so that we can cover as much ground as possible. Um, I alluded to, to uh, all the videos that I've done with CCF over the past 10 or 11 years. Uh, currently, we are in the middle of a documentary series, uh, patient stories, stories of hope. And we released our first one about a month ago about Eileen Bildman, who's a Ferrari race car driver, incredible story. And then just this week, we released our second one in the series. They're going to come out of the last week of every month on Mel Phillips, a former tennis coaching pro who has an awesome story as well. And this one is actually probably uh, uh, relevant to the conversations that we'll have with Dr. Doss today about clinical trials. Uh, Mel Phillips, his mom uh, was had a net uh, a net as well, and he is currently at the NIH study uh, that is studying. And I don't want to speak out of turn, Doctor Das, so correct me, but studying the genetic component to be as as you know, or a genetic component to be as vague as possible. And so he's currently in that trial. But I know we get questions about that every week. Um, so this may be of particular interest to those. Besides it being an awesome story. Um, it, it, it has that element that I know a lot of people are interested in. So we'll put that in the comment section. I'll put that for you so you can watch it. Um, and uh, I say this every week as well. If there's a topic in this disease, there's a good chance that we have covered it in some videos. So those videos are for you. That's why we create those. There's a free database at your disposal. Please leverage that, leverage that. So uh, go ahead and start sending in your questions. I see a few coming in already, but Dr. Das, I, you know, we chatted a little bit before we started recording today, and I always like to get updates from, from the, the guests on the show. Uh, and I know I told you that we'll probably get a lot of questions about clinical trials, but you had shared with me some of the, the exciting things that are going on in your world. Would you share that with the audience here today? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll start with a, a big update for the field uh, with regards to a clinical trial that was recently reported. Um, so, you know, as we know, the Netter 1 study was the study that got lutetium dotate, ERT, uh, approved in the United States and Europe. Uh, but that actually, that patient population was only patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. There was actually yet to be a randomized study presented in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. There was a study that was recently presented at ESMO just a few months back called the Opleur Random study. It was a French study, but it looked at patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors um, in the second line setting, so folks who had progressed on one line of cryotherapy, and looked at patients, uh, randomized them to either lutetium ERT or sunitinib, uh, which is a currently FDA approved anti vascular endothelial growth factor, anti blood vessel drug approved for pancreas nets. The primary endpoint, as in you know, many of our NET studies, was progression free survival with time to tumor growth. And uh, in the study, it was strongly positive in favor of lutetium PRRT. The median time to progression was 21 months um, in patients who received it and 12 months in, in the SNIT NIBAR. So, this is on you know, just one of the many sequencing studies that are currently ongoing. But actually, the first randomized study to show evidence of lutetium dotatate's benefit in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So that was a, a very exciting result. Um, also, in the realm of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, there's an alliance study, uh, which is sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. Uh, Tim Hobday at the Mayo Clinic is leading this. So this is also looking at patients with pancreatic nets. What makes this study really unique is it also includes patients with grade three well-differentiated pancreatic nets, which has classically been a group of patients that haven't been included in a lot of PRT-based studies, and is actually looking at lutetium dotate versus capecitabine and temozolomide, or CAP-10, uh, in patients with, with, uh, with pancreatic nets. 
And, you know, what's going to be very interesting is the primary endpoint is time consumer growth, progression-free survival, but the secondary endpoint is overall survival. We know many patients are going to end up getting both therapies, and so that will be very powerful to, to tell us, you know, which, which therapy uh, or which strategy might be, might be best. Um, so in addition to those studies in pancreatic nets, you know, of course, we have the netter 2 study, which is ongoing. Um, a very exciting study in first-line patients with grade 2 and grade 3 gastropancreatic nets, looking at lutetium dotatate versus um, high-dose somatostatin analogs. Uh, and there's a very similar study called the COMPOSE trial, which is looking at lutetium etereotide, a slightly different compound versus chemo or targeted therapy in the first-line setting. So very exciting that this um, October and um, you know, may be ushering kind of the first of our sequencing studies to result. Uh, but there are many more that are being conducted and, and hopefully will be resulting in the next one to two years as well. Awesome. Awesome. Love to hear that. And I know that people in the audience will as well. We get lots of questions about all, all of those, <laughs> those factors. Um, folks, I saw a comment uh, about uh, Dr. Das's microphone uh, getting a little feedback. If anyone else is hearing that, let me know. Uh, I had him switch microphones, so that might have been my mistake. We'll see. And if so, <clears throat> we'll have him switch back to the headphones, but please just let me know in the comments really quickly if you're also hearing that. Um, a couple things we want to say. We want to welcome a few people. We're reaching uh, far across the world today. Nepal, Zimbabwe. I love to see people watching this live from all over the world. And there is a guest in the audience that says, my specialist and hero. Thanks, Dr. Das from Tennessee. Thanks. That is Candace. So seeing that love uh, being sent uh, to, to our guests today already. <clears throat> Okay, questions already rolling in, so let's pivot. Uh, Lidiana says, and several other people are interested in this too, mm -hmm. how common is net metastases uh, uh, or metastasis to bone and spine? Um, and there's a follow-up question. Let's take that one first. Yeah, thanks for the question, Lidiana. So, you know, bone metastases from neuroendocrine tumors um, are not common, but certainly can happen. And what we tend to see is that uh, you know, site of origin of the primary tumor tends to dictate where the tumor likes to go. But, uh, you know, the most common sites for, for example, GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are liver, peritoneum, lymph nodes, but bone can absolutely be seen. And oftentimes what we'll see is folks with longer disease courses who've had their diagnosis for, you know, a decade, 10 years or longer will eventually develop bone metastases. Um, patients with higher grade neuroendocrine carcinomas are actually more inclined to develop bone metastases early on in their course, um, but bone metastases can absolutely happen. Got it. Uh, let's pause for a moment. I did get some feedback from other people. Let's switch you back to the headphones, okay. if you don't mind. And folks, sure. that is on me. Uh, it did sound different than it sounds now, but beforehand I had him take the take those off. So I will take the responsibility for that one. But in the meantime, I want to say two things. One um, regardless of, of the microphone, there's a tool that really helps you, uh, during these shows, because sometimes we're talking quickly. Sometimes we're talking, you know, there's big words when we're talking about medical, uh, medical issues. So there is a closed captioning, which just, which just means subtitles. There's a closed captioning feature at the bottom of your Facebook screen. If you kind of hover over the bottom right corner, you can expand your screen, you can cut the volume up or down. And if you see CC, then, uh, you can put those, um, auto-generated subtitles on and sometimes uh sometimes that helps and also if you're not if you're listening in a place where you can't have the volume up this is, this helps in a lot of different scenarios and i also just wanted to say i'd be remiss if i didn't take a moment just to, to send some love to the folks uh, of florida and as this hurricane moves north i'm in north carolina so we're preparing for for uh what's coming i think later tonight uh, but everyone on the east coast which if you live in this part of the country you're used to to getting beat up from these storms but uh it's looking bad down there and i know that we have a lot of people in that area on our expert side on our patient side and i just want to send love uh to everybody down there and hope you're doing well and staying safe um so lidiana's follow-up question uh give me a little test uh doc dr das yeah how about now that sounds that sounds better yeah definitely less feedback appreciate that and thanks folks for for your feedback too that helps me do my job better so lidiana also says is it is a liver cyst a concern if you have had a net i guess before so uh lidiana not necessarily i think as long as the liver cyst is stable in size now liver cysts are not typically associated with neuroendocrine tumors now if liver cysts get big enough they can sometimes cause pain and compression and other things but I think as long as a liver cyst is staying stable 
And to be very honest, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between a cyst and a neuroendocrine tumor metastasis. Uh, but that's why oftentimes uh, things like MRIs uh, or even Dota tape scans can be quite, quite useful in, in making that distinction. Got it. Thank you so much. <clears throat> From Lynn, does a copper dotate PET scan just light up tumors, or does it also show if tumors have increased or decreased when comparing uh, a previous copper dotate scan? Yeah, Lynn, thanks for that question. So a uh, copper dotate scan usually um, is fused with a CT scan. So usually it's a dotate PET CT. And so the CT portion of that scan is non-contrasted. So it doesn't quite delineate size or show size as good as a contrasted CT scan, but we can absolutely get some commentary on the size of, of tumors as well. Um, but honestly, what the, the dotate scans, both copper and gallium are best known for is actually showing the somatostatin receptor expression of tumors. So oftentimes to measure size, we'll use a more traditional scan like a CT or MRI. Got it. Thank you. From Eileen, uh, Eileen says, hi, 21 years ago, I had a stage one uh, pancreatic net removed with two thirds of my pancreas. And now um, uh, I am diagnosed with carcinoid net tumor in the left lower lobe. Do you think that they are related? I had a lobectomy on September 13. That's a great question, Eileen. Um, you know, my gut feeling is that they are likely distinct tumors. Um, and I'm assuming here the left lower lobe of the lung. Um, now, we have seen delayed recurrences. I mean, folks can sometimes recur with low-grade tumors even 15, 20 years afterwards. Um, sometimes a marker that can be useful to define origin in this case is a marker called TTF1. TTF1 usually stains positive in lung uh, primary tumors and is typically negative in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So um, while it could be, it is less likely to reflect uh, recurrence and more likely to represent a second primary tumor. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, PRT question from Anne. After PRT with Alpha Medx 2 is surgery ever an option? Hmm. Uh, thanks for the question, Anne. So, uh, so in this case, the, the PRT that, um, that Anne's referring to is alpha therapy, which is, of course, you know, something that's very exciting and I think something that we can touch on you know, a little bit later. You know, I think one of the theoretical advantages of alpha-based PRT is increased shrinkage. Um, but a, a lot of the surgical question depends on what were the sites of disease involvement to begin with. So, for example, you know, if someone had uh, liver and disease outside the liver, it's less likely that surgery may be attempted. However, if it was, for example, liver only disease and a, and a striking response was seen with the alpha PRT, you know, I think it would be very reasonable to consider it. So it really depends a little bit on sites of disease. I have a good follow-up question to that, which may, it could be, this could be something we've mentioned about the new trials that are going on, but Pam says, uh, what's the newest treatment out there? Her husband has had this for nine years, running out of options, sounds like starting to get frustrated. PRRT for the second time seems to be working okay, but other than the things you've mentioned, is there anything else that is, that, um, is kind of the, the, the newest best treatment or, you know, out there? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, really we'd be looking, um, and, and I'm sorry, just to clarify, her husband's primary tumor, do we know if it's um, small bowel, pancreatic? No, you can stuff? chime back in, Pam, but she does not say in this okay. just that he's had had it for almost nine years. So Almost nine years. Okay. So, um, so Pam, I think the, the best thing would be to try to enroll in a clinical trial. So there are a number of different agents that are being explored. So you know, one of the trials, for example, uh, is, a, is an alpha therapy study that's being looked at after lutetium dotatate. Um, so this is a study with actinium-225 that's going to be open at a number of centers, including Vanderbilt. Um, there are a number of uh, these anti-VEGF drugs or anti-blood vessel receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are being tested. So uh, the current study that's um, being led by Dr. Chan uh, at Dana-Farber is the cabinet study looking at cabozantinib. Um, I know that study still has slots open, and so that would be, I think, a very uh, important study. Um, there's likely going to be a study opening up very soon in the United States with a drug called surafatinib, which is another VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, and there are combinations with surafatinib um, and immune therapy that are also being explored in patients with neuroendocrine tumors 
Uh, and for example, that's a study that we also have open here. Um, so those would be kind of the trials, the, the VEGF-based studies or alpha therapy-based studies that I would, I would look into, Pam. Uh, and she did chime in, it said it was mid-gut. Mid-gut, okay. So yeah, all of these trials, uh, her husband would potentially be a candidate for. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your question, Pam. Uh, let me know if you have any, any other questions as well. From Monica, any updates on Dipnec as it relates to carcinoid tumors? So, you know, I, the, the expert on this is actually my colleague, Dr. Ramirez. Um, and so he can certainly correct me if I, if I misspeak on, on this, but I think, I think the big um, consideration with Dipnec is that, you know, we consider Dipnec as sort of a, um, I guess on the stage to a progression to a true pulmonary or lung neuroendocrine tumor. And I think the, the big thing is that with Dipnex is the decision of uh, when to treat or not to treat. I think there's a lot of emerging data that suggests that um, uh, Dipnex that are somatostatin receptor positive respond to somatostatin analogs, and that can slow their progression to lung neuroendocrine tumors or improve symptoms in patients. Um, but I think uh, that's kind of been the big insight. Um, but I don't know of any other sort of Dipnex specific uh, studies that that have been uh, initiated, but but I, I I you know I could have a little bit of a limited knowledge in this area. Copy that. And to that point, Monica and everyone else, Dr. Ramirez just uh, coincidentally happens to be our guest next week. So uh, I've I've actually been promoting that uh, that show quite a bit because we've seemed to have uh, Dr. Dawson increase in lung net questions on the show. We've mm -hmm. always had lung net questions, but I've yeah. noticed in the past month or two we've been getting a lot. So I've been letting people know, like, hey, you know, mm -hmm. we'll have an episode that is that can be primarily. Um, yeah. Uh, focused on that next week. So thanks for your question, Monica. Let me know if you have uh, any others. From Jackie, this is an interesting one. Is is it possible for a carcinoid tumor to be misdiagnosed as a hernia, especially if the patient has had carcinoid in the past and is presenting with all carcinoid symptoms now, stomach has been bad, unable to drink, uh, eat without severe burning, um, or able to lay down over two years um, and live in um, Nova Scotia, Canada, where getting tested is almost impossible. Yeah. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, Jackie, I mean, I think that's a, it's a, it's a great consider a great question because obviously neuroendocrine tumors certainly can recur even at delayed states. And I have seen sometimes folks that recur in the peritoneum or the lining uh, near the umbilicus be misdiagnosed as a hernia. Now, Usually a CAT scan is a good distinguishing factor, but if there are questions, and I know, you know access to imaging may be a challenge, but I would encourage trying to get a dotatate scan if possible, um, because that can really distinguish whether something may just be a hernia, or could there be a neuroendocrine tumor that may not be evident on a CAT scan or MRI that could be lurking as well. Got it, thank you. Uh, another question from our friend Lidiana about P nets, uh, how, or what's the most effective or accurate way to diagnose a net on the pancreas? Is CA 19.9 an indicator for deeper investigation? Yeah, Lidiana, that's again, a very interesting question. So CA 19.9 is classically a tumor marker that has been associated with pancreatic cancer or, uh, but in non, I would say non neuroendocrine pancreatic cancer, adenocarcinoma. However, CA 19.9 can be elevated in any uh, honestly, hepatobiliary tumor. So I, you know, I usually, I, I don't usually use CA199 as a routine screening methodology. Usually what we, what we do is if there's suspicion for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor on a CAT scan is we usually have our colleagues uh, in GI do an endoscopy with an ultrasound uh, to, to further characterize the pancreatic tumor and potentially get a biopsy. Um, but usually CA199 is, is not a specific marker for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. And is regular PET the best uh, to assess this or would dotatate uh, be best? Follow so, so yeah, so, I, I, so certainly if there's suspicion for a neuroendocrine tumor, a dotatate, uh, dotatate PET is better. Um, but usually something, you know, something should show up on the CAT scan or MRI, even if it's okay. not quite diagnostic, uh, but before the dotatate scan. Got it. And that was also from Lidiana. I didn't, I didn't clarify that, but um, okay. So Beth says I was diagnosed with mid gut tumors, 2007, age 54, two months ago, my older brother, 72 was also diagnosed with mid gut. Please speak about the risk to our 63 year old brother and also any genetic studies that, that may be out there. 
Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, this is a, a rare instance, but one that absolutely happens. So particularly in your family, you know, having two neuroendocrine tumors is, is quite rare. And I think what that merits is that um, at the minimum, um, you or your brother can get genetic testing. And, and by genetic testing, it's called germline testing. Um, usually, um, you know, your primary doc or even an oncologist can order that. They essentially draw a tube of blood and, uh, and send that off to look if there's a familial component. Um, you know, as you know, familial neuroendocrine tumors, uh, particularly mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors are very rare, you know, you know less than probably two to 3% of the time but certainly your family history lends itself to investigation. Now, if there is no family history uh, that's confirmed on this germline test, you know, I think you can be um, rest assured that it may just be chance that both you and, and your brother were diagnosed, uh, but I think you absolutely should get tested uh, for, for genetic screening. Thank you, and I appreciate your question. Uh, from Shane, I'm stable on land reatai for two years. Progression of some uh, 50 liver tumors now has prompted bland embolizations. Can embolization successfully eliminate uh, a lot of these tumors? Yeah, thanks for your question, Shane. So I think this is um, you know, kind of a perfect example of the multimodality care that patients with neuroendocrine tumors need because you know, sometimes we don't always need to change, for example, systemic therapy. So um, you know, in, in your case, Shane, because there was some growth in the liver tumors, embolization was utilized. So, you know, I think of embolization as more stabilizing disease. It can certainly make tumors shrink. It, it's not going to make them disappear, but it can absolutely stabilize the disease for months and even years. Um, so so I, I think that's the, um, the short answer to, to your question. Got it. Thank you. Uh, uh, is EDS or HSD connective tissue disorders related to net cancers? Um, to be very honest, I have not heard of that before. And so I, I, I can't speak to that. Got it. Um, <laughs> Amanda says, how do you ever sleep with the amount of amazing things you are involved in for your patients? We, we have a lot of hands and a lot of helpers and a lot of folks working toward this. So certainly, certainly get our sleep, but thanks, Amanda. <laughs> Absolutely. I appreciate that, Amanda. Okay, from Reese, I have stage four uh, grade one PNET in the tail. It's three, centim three centimeters with liver mets and have had two chemo embolizations and I'm on Lanria tie for 14 months. I've had two, uh, I've had two, diff two opinions, uh, different opinions on surgery. That's what the question is. So basically, Reese is trying to understand the pros and cons of surgery at this point, given given the situation. Yeah. So I think what what you're alluding to here is that you know whether maybe the primary tumor needs to be removed or not. And I think in the setting of folks with pancreatic nets, it is a little bit more controversial. There's not a clear answer about whether the primary tumor needs to be removed. Now, a three centimeter tumor is a pretty bulky tumor. Um, one of the things that we worry about with tail tumors is, you know, could they start invading the spleen or cause pain? Uh, and if there's any issues of worsening abdominal pain or splenic pain, that may certainly be a consideration. Um, typically, though, if the disease is stable on the lanreotide, I would not change anything um, as long as your symptoms are under control, uh, even though there may be a disease. Now, the one instance I, that I may consider um, a difference is that, for example, if the surgeons feel that they can get most of the disease uh, and it may lead to a break off all therapy, that might warrant consideration. Um, but in general, as long as the lanreotide is doing its job and you're not having worsening symptoms, I think it's fair to continue to stay on it. Got it. Thank you. Folks, if you just joined us recently or joined us a little bit late, this is Lunch of the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program. And today we're here with Dr. Satya, also known as Nanu Das. A lot of great questions today. I uh, appreciate you all being here. Let's keep sending them in and we will continue to, to try to get them answered for you. From Ruby, if a brain tumor lights up on a gallium scan, does that rule out men uh, meningioma? That's a great question, Ruby. So meningiomas are actually... Uh, the tumors that actually express somatostatin uh, expression as well. So actually, uh, if a tumor typically in, in the brain or usually meningiomas tend to be what we call, um, you know, they're extra parenchymal, meaning they're not in the brain tissue themselves, but can sometimes be in the dura or other areas. 
I actually think that if it lights up on the Dota tape scan, that's very suggestive of it actually being a meningioma. Got it. Thank you. Um, from Kristen, and we get this one a lot uh, or often, does lanreotide cause joint pain? Yeah, so Kristen, this is something that we're seeing more and more, particularly as folks are on somatostatin analogs for longer periods of time. Uh, we do see uh, some component of uh, what we call myalgias or arthralgias, so joint aches and muscle aches. So it, it can be seen, and it does seem to be a class effect. It's not common, but I certainly do have patients that have some joint aches and muscle aches you know, with, with the treatment over long periods of time. Got it. Thanks for your question, Kristen. From Marie, uh, and there's a little bit of case-specific information coming first, but let's 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 churn through it, and because uh, I think we can get to the question. I had a distal and splenectomy via robotic, January 2013. Octria scan showed six months later. Uh, liver Mets, primary tumor, well differentiated, stage four, grade two, KI 67.5%. Now pre-diabetic on metformin. Been on Sanostatin since, since uh, the June thir uh, 2013. Recently went from 20 mg to 30 milligrams due to tumor instability. Um, back in 2013, the oncologist said the liver lit up like a Christmas tree. And years later, I asked if the tumors can be resected. And she said they're barely visible on MRI uh, with contrast uh, with the Sanostatin. The next scan is coming up uh, in November of this year, <clears throat> the third one. Any chance, here's the question, any chance I'll ever be able to, to, to stop every four weeks anastatin and not have liver tumor growth? Is there something to help? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, some, sometimes uh, neuroendocrine tumors grow dormant as well. So I have patients that have been, for example, on sandostatin or lanreotide for years uh, that sometimes I'll give a break from all treatment because, you know, I don't know if my, the treatment is what's causing them, these tumors to freeze or if the natural course. And so I think it's, it's reasonable as long as, you know, there hasn't been recent tumor growth demonstrated because I recognize, you know, a monthly injection, there's obviously the physical pain, there's the commitment of having to come in monthly. Um, I, I think it, it can safely be stopped as well as long as your tumors are being followed, you know, with scans. Yeah. Um, so I think it um, is a little bit dependent on tempo, as long as there hasn't been recent disease progression on the 30 milligram dose. Um, you know, given that you've been on it for years, I think it's reasonable to think about a break just to see how things, uh, how things go. Yeah, I think I've heard that, that um, same opinion expressed uh, here on the show before. Um, but thanks for, thanks for that. And thanks for your question, Marie. Let me know if you have any more. Uh, so speaking of growth and monitoring that, Shane asks, uh, what is considered a lot of growth over three months? Um, he's, I think he's had one centimeter in four months. Any thoughts on this? I'm not sure if it's you know, uh, tumor dependent or, or like location dependent rather. Yeah, Shane, I think it's a great question. And, and Rand, you hit it on the head. I think it does depend a little bit on tumor grade and location. So in general, we think of you know, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, for example, having a little bit more rapid growth patterns, uh, but it really depends on sort of grade, right? So usually we think about, and again, this is just rough estimates, but usually we think about grade one tumors changing in the order of six to 12 months, grade two tumors changing on the order of three to six months. So it really depends on relative size, but, you know, a centimeter of growth is, is, is a good amount of change. Um, and so, you know, certainly begs the question of whether, you know, maybe the therapy that you're on needs to be changed or, or looked at. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And thanks, Shane. Uh, from Laura, Laura said, I had a thyroid, thyroidectomy in 2002, diagnosed with stomach and esophagus nets last year, and my TSH levels are not stable. Can this be related? That's a really good question, Laura. Um, <clears throat> You know, they, I would say in general, you know, thyroid function is not typically related to uh, neuroendocrine tumors. There are some familial syndromes where folks can get uh, thyroid abnormalities as well as pancreatic nets or, or sometimes gastric neuroendocrine tumors. But I do think the, um, perhaps the instability right now of the TSH is not necessarily related uh, to the gastric or esophageal neuroendocrine tumors. Got it. Thank you, Laura. Let me know if you have any more questions. From Kaylin, 
I am NED, no evidence of disease after small intestine resection of tumors slash nodes and um, lumpectomy from breast metastasis, still small net spots in small intestine that could not be removed. How important is it to have treatment of octreotide or lanreotide? Yeah, and I think um, if I can put the picture correctly, so you, you had uh, most of the disease uh, removed, certainly the distant disease removed, and maybe just a few small residual spots left. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think it really depends on tempo. So as long as those spots aren't changing and being monitored, mm -hmm. um, we don't need to initiate any therapy. Now, at some point, sure, could, could they change? And, and you know, we need to initiate octreotide or lanreotide. But one of the big things that I always discuss with my patients, particularly after a bigger surgery is that we don't want to rush to treatment because if there can be a period of years when we don't have to do anything and nothing is changing, uh, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think we can just watch it. And as long as it's not changing, we don't have to rush to any treatment. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Cheryl on behalf of her mom, she says, my mom just finished her, her 12 rounds of chemo for stage four appendiceal goblet cell carcinoma. While it has done a great job of shrinking the two tumors, one to the point of being insignificant, that's good to hear, her doctor has said she will need chemo maintenance for the rest of her life, and this just doesn't seem sustainable. Have you ever seen or heard of, of, of any other options? Yeah, Cheryl, uh, thanks for the question. So goblet cell adenocarcinomas tend to be, so they're on the spectrum of appendiceal tumors. And actually, we, we have some work that we're presenting at NANA this year that actually goblet cell adenocarcinomas, even though they've been grouped with neuroendocrine tumors, really don't actually have any neuroendocrine features. They don't light up on somatostatin. They really behave more like appendiceal adenocarcinomas. Hmm. So I think the big thing that I would ask Cheryl is that um, it, it depends on where your mom's disease is. For example, if it is only limited to the abdomen, I think after six months, it's a great time to think about could surgery be possible? The surgeries that are usually quite helpful in this disease can be some things called high tech surgery, where the surgeons actually go in and debulk and remove as much cancer as possible. Um, and certainly with the response that it seems that she's had, that might be a good question to ask for. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes if high tech is not possible, I think what the, the treating oncologist can do is, again, back off on the chemo. So sometimes give just ma uh, one maintenance drug. And again, I have seen goblet cell adenocarcinomas because they're a spectrum that maybe after six to 12 months of stable disease, sometimes we give folks a clean break as well, as long as scans are being done frequently. So I think, you know, my sort of approach would be, is she a surgical candidate um, if she's just limited to the abdomen? And if not, um, you know, after maybe a little bit more maintenance therapy, could a clean treatment break be broached? Because I think that would be very reasonable. Got it. Thank you. Next question comes from Jennifer. What are treatment options for microtumors that are un unable to be removed surgically? Uh, surgery did remove three already. And one medical provider suggested uh, alcohol ablation. Is that a solid treatment option? So Jennifer, I'm assuming, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that these probably are gastric neuroendocrine tumors that are being referred to um, because there's different types of what we call endoscopic ablation techniques that can be done. Um, I think really, you know, it depends on how much are they changing. For, for example, some patients with gastric neuroendocrine tumors, it's like weed whacking, basically. These tumors are not going to be uh, cause problems clinically. But mm -hmm. once a year, the GI docs go in, take a look. If, for example, they've grown a little bit, they, you know, shear them off. But we know that we can't completely clear them. So uh, I think it depends a little bit on kind of the tempo of how, if they've changed. But certainly endoscopic ablations are, uh, can be, uh, you know, a reasonable approach. Got it. Thanks, Jennifer. From Jason, another question about lanreotide. I've been on it for two years now. Will the side effects worsen or get easier? I deal currently with nervousness and confusion, primary and rectal, and now uh, liver. Yeah, Jason, that's a really good question. You know, so I, I think that the, the, the true answer is that it really is so individual dependent. Um, I have seen folks whose symptoms initially actually over time get better. Usually that's what happens because as the drug reaches a steady, a steady state rather in the body, the side effects become less prominent. But one of the things to think about, particularly, you know, if something's like confusion, because of course that's something that's quite bothersome and naturally, you know, scary, you know, would 
would maybe switching to octreotide be an option? You know, the, I've had patients where we have side effects with one of the somatostatin analogs, we switch to the other and the side effects get better. So something to, to talk about with your oncologist for sure. Absolutely. Thanks for that. And, uh, and good luck, J Jason. Thanks for your question. Next question from Tina. Uh, can peanuts with Mets to the liver now go going, going for biopsy of thyroid? Okay. Got it. Can peanuts, uh, uh, with Mets to the liver now going for biopsy of thyroid. Can this also be, can this also be Mets to thyroid on cap 10? Hmm. Yeah, Tina, it's a, a really good question. I think um, while rare, I actually have seen metastases from pan the pancreas to the thyroid before. Uh -huh. But one of the things I always think about too is could it be a separate thyroid process? Because you know there are some um, also some familial syndromes, uh, things like uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia, in which folks can have thyroid nodules as well as pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So I think important to really interrogate that thyroid nodule, whether it's with an ultrasound or a biopsy. Uh -huh. To see, first of all, is it cancer? Uh, second of all, if it is, you know, is it a neuroendocrine tumor that's metastasized, or is it potentially a something a different entity? Got it. Thank you. Um, here's a good question from Cindy. And first of all, Cindy says, "Hi, Dr. Doss. It's been over five years since Whipple surgery at Vandy, and I have not had a follow-up visit because my surgeon is no longer there." How often do you recommend patients that have no evidence of disease uh, come in for updates? <clears throat> yes, Cindy. So we should definitely have you come back and see 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 one of us. Um, you know, I think at least once a year. Um, now that you've sort of hit the five year mark, that's wonderful. But you know, we know that neuroendocrine tumors um, can come back. You know, ten and even sometimes later. So at minimum, after a curative surgery, I follow my patients for ten years. So we would love to see you back, um, you know, and, and follow up with some scans uh, to just check on things. All right, Sandy, there you go. Um, from Darren, PNET, spleen, and liver mets are stable for 12 months on land reotide only. Uh, is a centrally necrotic tumor a huge concern for jump-starting growth? And uh, for some context, KI67, 18%. Yeah, Darren, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Um, I think actually the tumor necrosis here is more reflective of the grade. Uh, you know, you have a, a grade two tumor, but that's a pretty high KI-67 index. And so, you know, I, I would just make sure that you're probably getting scans every three months just to make sure that this tumor isn't taking off. I think it's great that you have stable disease. So I don't think it's the necrosis by itself that means that the tumor is going to take off. But I think it just means that you have a more potentially rapidly growing neuroendocrine tumor. So if there are any changes, we want to be able to detect that quickly and make changes to your regimen. Got it. Thank you. Next question. And folks, we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, so keep them coming. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. We've been, we've been uh, clicking them off today. This is nice. Uh, from Mary, I also had a net resection of uh, the ileum that spread with spread to nodes. And then six years later, triple positive breast cancer. Is there a relationship between the two? Can I assume they would have tested uh, the breast tumor for neuroendocrine cancer? Yeah, great question. All right. Um, we, you know, no one has actually published this data, but we are seeing, I don't know, I think whether it's a kind of a, a hormonal aspect, we see a lot of overlap um, in folks, uh, our, our patients that are women with between neuroendocrine and breast uh, cancer. I, I, they, they definitely would have tested the breast cancer to make sure that it is not a neuroendocrine okay. tumor. Um, but, you know, this is something that we're definitely seeing. Um, and it may be such that neuroendocrine tumors tend to happen a little bit later in life, uh, as, you know, sometimes breast cancer does as well. But I have seen a disproportionate link between women with breast cancer and neuroendocrine tumors. So something that, you know, we as a field need to study a little bit better. Got it. Hey, thanks for that, that question. Um, and I have heard that question often, often before uh, on the show as well. Uh, from Lynn, can an MRI be done the same time a copper Dota Tate PET scan? So there are some places, um, like I know Mayo Clinic uh, does Dota Tate MRI. It's not common. Uh, usually there are two separate tests, but there are certain neuroendocrine centers that can combine a Dota Tate and uh, MRI together. 
Interesting. Got it. Uh, follow up from from Cindy, who who uh, was just asking about coming back in after her Whipple five years ago. Uh, is it possible for a net to return and then and not be seen on an octreotide scan? <clears throat> Yeah, definitely, Cindy. Um, so I, you know, I think, um, especially because it's been some time, you know, what I would recommend when you come back and see us is that we actually get a Dota tape scan, because we know that Octrea scans are, you know, we're the prior best scan, but now they're not the gold standard anymore. They just, they don't pick up things as good as Dota tape. Um, so definitely, I think it's worth it to, to think about a Dota tape scan. So, Dr. Doss, you know very well the the the, the net community uh, and patients are are often very well educated, and a lot of the questions we get here are very thought provoking, uh, sometimes under current debate and discussion. But we still get people new to the show, new to this journey every week, and so we always like to to answer and and sometimes uh, establish some just foundational knowledge. So we have a great question here from Music Man. Uh, uh, who is here on behalf of their mother, um, which it, I think is the first time because I would I would remember that name. Uh, this is a, a good question that we often get. Uh, I'm sure you have before as well. What is the difference between carcinoid cancer and neuroendocrine cancer? Hmm. Great question, music man. So this actually comes back to just what's in a name, right? So uh, carcinoid tumors. Have, uh, so car first of all, the, the first pathologist to ever diagnose a carcinoid tumor was a guy by the name of Siegfried Obendorfer in Germany at the turn of the 20th century. And so he actually saw these neuroendocrine tumors uh, from removed appendiceal tumors and small bowel resections. And he, they look like cancer cells under the microscope, uh, but they didn't quite behave like cancer cells in terms of he didn't see the spread, he didn't see invasion at that time. So he called them carcinoidy or carcinoma-like. And since that time, carcinoid has stuck. So. Now, carcinoid tumors classically refer to uh, mid-gut or neuro, uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, uh, but carcinoid tumors are a type of neuroendocrine tumor. So we think of neuroendocrine tumors as being the bigger entity. Neuroendocrine tumors can start anywhere. Actually, uh, to Rain, your earlier point, the most common individual site for neuroendocrine tumors is in the lung, actually. Um, but they can start in the pancre pancreas, they can start in the GI tract. But classically now, a non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor can still be called a carcinoid tumor, but it actually goes back to the, the way these things were named. Got it. Thank you so much for that. Music Man, thanks for your question. Uh, send our love to your mom and please, you know, lean on us. This is what the show is for. So glad to see you here. Uh, I'm glad you're asking questions. Continue to do so, please. Um, from Kristen, my husband is experiencing joint pain, inflammation in his finger and TMJ. Could it possibly be a side effect of octreotide? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Now, you know, we think of um, octreotide and lanreotide causing less inflammatory arthritis. They can kind of cause more soreness and things like that. I think if inflammatory arthritis is being suspected, you know, maybe good to just also rule out rheumatologic processes because I haven't seen octreotide or lanreotide cause inflammatory arthritis. I've seen more joint aches, but um, that inflammation, I think, should be explored a little bit more um, through perhaps a rheumatologist. Got it. Thank you. Um, question from Janice or Janice. Um, what is narcosis? I don't know if they are referring to when we were uh, referencing necrosis uh, mm. a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Janice, I think so. So necrosis um, just means, so sometimes cancer cells and neuroendocrine cells outgrow their own blood supply. So what tends to happen is a part of the cancer cell dies. Well, a part of it is still alive. And so necrosis just represents that portion on a scan that represents dead tumor or dying tumor cells. So a lot of times, for example, in a neuroendocrine tumor, we see the rim light up and that's kind of active cancer and the center be darker on a CAT scan. And sometimes that can be more reflective of uh, necrosis. Got it. Uh, hopefully that helps. And, and let me know if that did in fact answer, answer your question, uh, Janice. From Fred, um... Is there a timeline for surgical intervention or treatment for a very slow growing lung net for an individual who had, who's had no symptoms for years? Uh, is surveillance a continued option for the long term? And then also, uh, when would a lung net become a serious problem? How would one know? So it's a few questions in there, but it's, mm -hmm. it's covering some, some ground with it for the lung net. Yeah, Fred, that's a, it's a, a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important that I would um, ask is what is 
uh, sort of the grade or is the lung net a typical lung neuroendocrine tumor kind of more akin to a grade one or is it atypical because you know if it's an atypical lung neuroendocrine tumor even if it's very slow growing we tend to favor getting it out because we know that atypical uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors can give more rise to metastasis and so if we can prevent metastasis that's the goal but if it's a typical lung neuroendocrine tumor that's just changing very slowly over time, I think surveillance is very, a very reasonable option. Um, you know, I think uh, whether it's six to 12 month scans, making sure nothing is changing. Um, but I think if we're seeing continued patterns of change, that may be a, a signal to say, hey, maybe we should get it out. Um, so tempo and the nature of the tumor are probably the two biggest factors here. Got it. Hey, folks, I have a couple of announcements because I know some people sign off a little bit earlier. Or they have to go back to work or, or whatever. So since we have about nine or 10 minutes left, uh, one, especially uh, because of the last question that we got, we've already mentioned Dr. Ramirez's episode coming up next week. But here's the announcement for that. It's actually on Wednesday of next week due to his his scheduling. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is the fifth. Now I'll announce it on Monday. Like I typically do, I'll re-announce it on Wednesday to remind you. And then of course you'll probably get a notification when, once we go live, but I just wanted to make mention of that now, because we, again, I even, uh, saw people making notes about the fact that we'll have a, a primary focus on, on lung nets next week. So that'll be Wednesday, the fifth. And also it has been almost one day shy of one month since our COO, Grace Goldstein has stepped down and retired, who has been the heart and soul of the foundation for almost 20 years, folks. And I've worked with her for about 11 of those. And even though it has been uh, already been a month since she's been gone, we still feel her presence all around us. So send some love to Grace in the comments and we have eight minutes left. So let's keep it going. From Laura, uh, what is the possibility of having gastric and rectal nets? Well, it's, it's possible. It's not, um, it, not as usual, but sometimes we know gastric neuroendocrine tumors are, they're kind of their own entity. They sometimes arise what we call sporadically or in the setting of perhaps reflux or being on an anti-acid medication. So you certainly can have both. It's, it's uncommon, but you certainly can have both. Uh, but they're certainly two different entities. Got it. Thanks, Laura. Uh, from Norma, I have nets due to AMAG. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the acronym is, but should I get my children tested? Norma, I would love to know what um, you know AM AMAG here refers to. If it is a genetic syndrome, absolutely, you should you know get get your kids tested. Um, you know there are increasingly syndromes that we're not even aware of that are associated with neuroendocrine tumors right. that tend to be. So I think it's important to get tested, but um, but I would want to know if, if that refers to a specific uh, genetic condition. Yeah, Norma, we've got like seven minutes. If you're still on the call uh, and you don't mind spelling out that acronym, uh, go ahead. That would be helpful. OK, so from Kathy and, and many other people, can you explain KI-67 in terms of growth rate in real time? <clears throat> yeah, it's a great question, Kathy. So KI-67 is, um, is a surrogate for cell division, right? So KI-67 is a protein that when neuroendocrine cells and actually other cancer cells for that matter, when they divide, you see an uptick in KI-67. And so we usually look at tempo of KI-67 as the way we follow our patients with scans. So for example, a KI-67 of less than 3% or akin to a grade one, usually the doubling time is on the order of six to 12 months. Usually KI-67s of five to 10% or greater than 10% are on the order of three to six months. And KI-67s of usually greater than 20%, usually within three months, we can see doubling times. And so that kind of informs how frequently we scan patients either on or off treatment. Got it, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Das, we talked in the beginning about you know, some of the exciting news and research that's happening right now, which I assume that you're excited about. Um, Let's let's kind of approach it from the the opposite the perspective. Uh, what areas would you like to see more effort or money or interest uh, into? Like, what are some of the gaps that you you would really like to to fill in terms of our ability to diagnose or treat this disease? Mm -hmm. um, I would love, you know, so it's a great question, Rain. So I would love to see more uh, drug development efforts for patients with um, non pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as well. So I think that's the great thing about some of these VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors. They are also being tested in patients with non-pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. You know, as we know, folks with pancreatic nets tend to have the most treatment options, but folks with non-pancreatic nets, drug development has lagged behind. Uh, 
-hmm. And so that is a, a really you know, important aspect. You know, I'd, I'd love to actually see studies um, looking at, for example, um, SUV changes uh, on Dota Tape Pet. There's a lot of controversy about, you know, after PRT or after treatment, how do SUV changes actually correspond to patient response? You know, does more SUV mean progression? Not necessarily. So I'd love to see more research, you know, invested into, into that. Um, and then I'd, I'd actually love to see more, more efforts uh, invested into, you know, multimodality therapies. So, you know, as we know in clinical practice, we use embolization or we use surgery before things like PRRT. And, you know, the honest truth is, as we're developing these trials, there's a lot of resistance to multimodality trials because they're complicated. There's multiple sure. disciplines. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing them. So that is definitely, you know, an, an area that I'd, I'd love to see. Um, and then, of course, you know, screening is a huge thing, right? So there's always a search for better biomarkers. So there's a big blood-based marker called circulating tumor DNA, which is now starting to make some headway in other cancers like colon cancer, uh, breast cancer. And the question is, can we develop a sensitive blood-based marker in patients that, for example, are having symptoms? that might suggest a neuroendocrine tumor that can be readily utilized. You know, of course, the NET test is a powerful marker as well, but you know, there's some things about access to that test that sometimes make it harder to utilize. So I'd love to see more efforts, perhaps looking at circulating tumor DNA and how that relates to screening or early detection in, in NET patients. You know, I've heard the multiple modalities uh, um issue raised before so i think that the the dialogue is is, is shifting in that direction right like uh yeah. so hopefully that's a, that's a good sign because multiple people are, are, are thinking about it too uh we did have a question from one of your answers just now um uh, maria says what are suv changes mm -hmm. so um suv maria is standardized uptake value so that's basically how we quantify the extent of somatostatin expression that's present on a neuroendocrine tumor cell and so SUV uh, in the context of a Dota Tate scan refers to basically the concentration of somatostatin receptor. And so sometimes you can actually measure it. We always measure it relative to things like the liver and spleen. So you can sometimes see commentary on changes and, and that's what that, that refers to. Um, and Rain, I was just, I'm sorry to just take you back briefly to that, that point. We, you know, we have a pilot study that's gonna open probably in the next three to four months, um, you know, at Bandy, very small, uh, five to six patients, but folks with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors looking at surgical debulking before PRRT to remove bulky tumors and then giving PRRT uh, because of some of the success that we've seen. So hopefully that will be a, a signal to the greater uh, community to maybe inspire larger studies if we see the signal that we anticipate. That's awesome to hear. And, and, and you uh, totally hit my next question, which was, I was going to ask like, what's, what else is, is coming up in, in your world. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, last question, best advice to a very recently or newly diagnosed patient. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think the best advice and, and rain, you alluded to this earlier is that, you know, buy into to the community because you're not alone in this journey at all. And, uh, you know, one, you know, next, uh, we always joke that nets, sure, the new cases of neuroendocrine tumors is rare, but incidence is not, you know, 180,000 Americans have a diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor. And, and beyond that, our net patient advocacy groups and communities like CCF, NCAN, uh, uh, and others are so strong. And so, you know, the biggest asset and biggest contributor to information beyond your oncologist and, and others is, your, is the, the community. And folks, you know, I've seen in the net community are so willing to share their own journeys and their own information <clears throat> Totally, that, that that is such a powerful tool. So I think getting connected is perhaps the, the best piece of advice that I can give. And the second piece of advice being, you know, if you can come and see a, a net expert, someone who does this a lot, because the perspective that he or she can provide may really be helpful for looking at the overall landscape. And, and we work with, with your local oncologists. Um, and, and so we're happy to work together uh, but those would be, I think, the two big pieces that, that I would offer off the bat. Awesome. Thank you so much, folks. That is our time for today. Music Man says, what day and time will you be back? Oh, and also Music Man, I'm not a doctor. This this guy is, but I'm I, <laughs> I'm just a, a filmmaker. Uh, but typically every Thursday at this time, yeah. however, next week, and so I want to reiterate one more time, it is Wednesday at same time, 12 noon Eastern. 
Um, Mary says, thank you for these weekly streams. So helpful. Beth says, thank you so much for all, all of this great info and your continued focused. Uh, lots of uh, people enjoyed the show today as did I, Dr. Das. Thank you for being back with us and sharing your experience and knowledge and all this new exciting uh, things that are happening right now in this space. Thanks, Ryan. It's always so much fun to, to be part of this. So. Absolutely. We appreciate you and we appreciate you folks at home. As always, we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. And uh, again, I'll reiterate uh, one, you can replay this video anytime. As soon as uh, the show's over, it will post on Facebook. Next week, I'll put it on the YouTube and if you have other, other questions, reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, either here on the Facebook page or at carcinoid.org. Thanks again, and as always, our, to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals, without whom this program uh, would, would not be possible. And then finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. Thank you for watching. And please join us next time, next week on Wednesday for Luncheon with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.